Well, good morning. Good morning. Chatty group this morning. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, before we begin, as usual, we'll open with prayer. Uh, if I could, uh, Phil, would you please pray for us? Thank you. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day. Uh, thank you for the beauty of your creation. Thank you, Father, for the creation leads from every one of us in your image. Pray, Lord, that as Michael teaches this class, our hearts and our spirits are open to you. And Father, I pray you give us the strength of your Holy Spirit to understand and live the gospel that you ask us to do. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Well, this week we are in chapter 5 of the Gospel of John. Just as a, a brief recap, uh, you recall that John is organizing the first 12 chapters of his Gospel around these seven signs, particularly six that appear in those chapters themselves, and then pointing to the seventh, which is the resurrection. And so far we have encountered the first sign, uh, the turning of water into wine, in chapter 2, and then we just saw the second sign, in the previous chapter, indeed, John tells us at the very last verse of chapter 4, this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Well, chapter 5 is going to open with the next sign, and we're moving now toward the center of that structure that I have previously put on the board. Chapter 6 is the central sign that interprets the rest, but we're not quite there yet. And so we get into chapter 5, and we open with this. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool. So two comments there. One is, he's, uh, we're now back in Jerusalem. We've shifted from Judea to Galilee, now back to Judea, and we're now specifically Jerusalem. And so you have a geographical shift, but you also have this reference to a pool. Right. A pool, you say, right? This should, this should get you thinking, based on what we have seen so far in this gospel, it should hint to you what is about to happen. Why? What is, what is the significance, symbolically, for John of a pool? Water. Water. And where have we seen water so far? In the beginning, the first sign. We saw it in the first sign. Where else? So John the Baptist back in chapter 1. So John the Baptist, we got the water with the first sign. And where else? <clears throat> a couple other places. Yeah, yeah, so that was the first sign. So you got water to wine. You got John the Baptist in chapter 1. Water to wine, chapter 2. What's next? There are a couple more. So, uh, woman, at the well. well, woman at the well, there's, there's one. So, woman at the well, right? You got a well of water, and you're talking about water. It's chapter four. Um, so, that gives us chapters one, two, and four, which means also, you, can anybody remember chapter three? Nicodemus. It's Nicodemus, and, and there's, what does Jesus say to Nicodemus in, in reference to water? Born the spirit. Yeah, born of water and the spirit. So in all the previous chapters, we've seen water come up. Uh, it's, a, it's important for John symbolically, uh, hinting at purification. So the moment we get to chapter 5, now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool. We don't even have to read any farther than that to know what's about to happen. We know that something pertaining to spiritual sanctification, symbolically represented in some perhaps miraculous act, is about to occur because we've seen it all the way up to this point. And so we're already, uh, John has primed us to read the text that way uh, by this point, at least uh, hopefully. So now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. And these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an in invalid for 38 years. Now, uh, notice, and you may have notes in your Bible on this, um, you see verse 3, right? And you see verse 5. Where did verse 4 go? Yeah. 
<laughs> Eleanor, did you cut verse 4 out of your Bible? <laughs> so nobody's gone in here and crossed it out or excised it from their text, right? And yet, raise your hand, and depending on version, raise your hand if you do have verse 4. What version are you using? New King James, and I'm assuming saying, yeah, New King James. Okay, so yeah, so what you're going to get, this is a text critical issue. I'm not going to go down this road very far, but in uh, the King James Version and the New King James Version and those uh, versions that follow the uh, Masoretic text, um, or, excuse me, those, uh, those versions that follow the uh, Textus Receptus, uh, they will have the verse 4, what is labeled in the KJV as verse 4, so uh, KJV, the language is in verse four, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And so that particular uh, uh, verse in the text is explanatory. It's saying, okay, why do you have all of these people who, have, who are blind, lame, paralyzed? Why are they lying there trying to get into the pool? Um, and indeed, you see that even at the end of the uh, KJV's version in verse 3. At the end, it says they are waiting for the moving of the water. And so it gives this explanation for why they're trying to get into the pool, which you actually don't get if you're reading another version like the ESV or, or whatever. Um, now, again, that is a text critical issue. You will have some manuscripts that have it. You will have other manuscripts that don't have that verse. And some would argue that it was a, a later interpolation designed to provide some background explanation. Others would say, no, actually, it is original to the text. Uh, again, without getting into that discussion, just be aware that sometimes you do get uh, those kinds of text critical uh, issues in your Bible. Uh, and it is no cause for concern, again, because it doesn't substantially in any way change the meaning of the text. Uh, it doesn't in any substantial way change the, uh, the, the argument that John is making. And on top of that, my own default uh, view is given that this was in the text received by the church for centuries. Uh, the Textus Receptus was, the, of course, widely used for the versions of the Bible that you see, for example, in the Reformation, post-Reformation. My default assumption is, well, if God at least permitted our fathers to receive that, then it, at, it certainly can't be harmful. Um, and so even if you come to the conclusion that, okay, maybe it's not original, well, certainly it can't be harmful. This is something that they received uh, and that informed their, their reading of the text. So, just, yes, ma'am. My note down here has verse 4, and it says, the, when the angel would come down, the first one into the pool after each disturbance would be cured of whatever disease he had. So, you're saying an angel is curing people. Now, is that, is that why they would take it out? Because only Jesus is going to be able to. Well, I, I don't think so. So uh, they, they would have been comfortable with God using instrumental causes. And so uh, there's nothing in Scripture that would prohibit an angel from having an ability to heal. For example, later on, later on we see the apostles in the book of Acts healing people. And they're not Jesus, but they're doing so in the power of Christ. Um, could an angel hypothetically have, have done this? Um, could, an angel, could, have, could an angel have been responsible in some way for the healing uh, used to it, but, but only one person would get healed. Only right. One. Yeah, only the first one in after each disturbance. And why that would have been the case it doesn't explain. That to, uh, the, even, that, even if you include verse 4, it doesn't explain why that would have been the case. Um, but there's nothing in, in a sort of a biblical worldview that would prohibit that from being the case. Um, although maybe it could have been the case that, let's say, it was original and someone later along uh, thought that was a little weird and a little uncomfortable, and so they took it out. Uh, or alternatively, it wasn't original, and then later someone said, hey, we need an explanation for why they're waiting by the pool, and so they include this. Um, so those are your two major options for how we ended up with these two divergent textual traditions. But, um, and it's not repeated in other Gospels? No, no. no. Uh, any other questions on that? Comments? Well, they mention it again in verse 7. 
Right. So down in verse seven, you get the sick man says, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going another steps down before me. Now, notice that it's the sick man saying this. Mm -hmm. So it's put in quotation marks, right? It's his quote. And so he's giving his account of what they believed was happening. And there's a difference between someone saying that that's what they believe is happening versus actually including the narrative in verse four, you know, saying this is what's happening, right? There's a world of difference between someone saying, okay, this is our explanation. Perhaps someone might say, well, that's just their superstition. And he believed that superstition. But if it's actually, if verse four is, is legitimate, then, um, uh, no, actually, that is the explanation. That's not just what the man believed. It really was the case that the angel was stirring up the water and then consequently healing people. Uh, again, I, I, I don't think that that's, that's ruled out by anything in our biblical worldview, whether that is the case or not. Um, you know, I, I'm, 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 my default assumption, as I said, is to receive uh, the text as the church received it uh, for centuries and to say it's probably uh, as good an explanation as any as to why they are actually waiting for the water. Anything else? So I just wanted to point that out. Now we're back to the narrative. This man is, uh, he's been in invalid for 38 years. He's waiting here by the pool. Uh, verse six, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, uh, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Seems like something of a silly question. Uh, of course, if the man had a choice, he would want to be healed. Uh, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. So again, uh, whatever is going on with this pool, this sick man views it as, I just can't, it can't happen, right? Someone's always going to get there before me. I, this is just not working out for me. But his answer to the question is not, Jesus asks, do you want to be healed? And we might expect the immediate answer would be, yes, I want to be healed. But the man jumps immediately to the explanation about the pool because in his mind at this point, the window of possibilities for him to be healed is this narrow. For him, it's only the pool. So he jumps straight to that explanation and effectively he's saying, yeah, I would love to be healed, but I can't because I can't get to the pool in time to be healed. And in his mind, that's his only out. That is the only way that he's going to be able to solve his problem. And Jesus of, course, Jesus, of course, in verse 8, is going to widen those possibilities considerably. Uh, he's not going to be left trying to get in a pool. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. I suspect that there is an intersection here between the nature of the man's affliction, on the one hand, and the response that he gives to Jesus' question. Uh, Remember, at this point, and consistently all throughout the Book of Signs, the miracles that Jesus is performing, as I've said, have a spiritual significance. They're obviously literal, they really did happen, but they have a figurative meaning. They're pointing to something more fundamentally spiritual, and that usually maps on to the spiritual reality. So, for example, you know, when you're dealing either in the last sign with the boy close to death, or when you, you get to Lazarus and he's actually dead, and you have Jesus raise this person to life, well, yes, it's literal resurrection, but it's also the case that it's figurative. Jesus is pointing to, toward the reality that he can give spiritual life to people. I think that something similar is going on here. Right? This man uh, is an invalid. Right? He can't get in the pool because, of, because he's an invalid. And the, the nature of that malady corresponds to the nature of his spiritual affliction as well. He is, he is spiritually paralyzed. Uh, he doesn't understand and he can't see beyond the narrow window of this pool is the solution to my problem. He can't actually see that, no, there are actually uh, other solutions to your problem. Namely, of course, all of those solutions find their source in God himself. And God can do what he wants when he wants. And certainly he can heal this man uh, without using a pool. And so he doesn't see that the answer is staring him in the face as he's talking to Jesus. Very much, again, like the woman in the well, not recognizing that her spiritual problem is solved by the man standing in front of her. She doesn't get it until the end. So this man is healed. Now, that day was the Sabbath, we're told. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. Now, 
Yes, it is the Sabbath. That's true. Their conclusion, of course, is false. They say it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. Uh, this itself is not prohibited uh, by the Sabbath requirements, particularly given the context. Uh, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. We see this in the Synoptic Gospels. And John, remember, by the way, would have assumed that his audience was already familiar with the Synoptic Gospels. And so they would have been familiar with the debates between Jesus and the Pharisees surrounding uh, the nature of the Sabbath. Well, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He's told the man to take up his bed and walk. There's nothing wrong with this at all. Uh, and yet they are trying to impose their man-made traditions uh, in prohibiting this man from taking up his bed. Man answers, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. So he appeals to this man's authority. He doesn't know that his name apparently is Jesus. Uh, he doesn't know who Jesus is. He just knows this man healed him. And he says, he told me, take up your bed and walk. And the very fact that Jesus healed him becomes the grounds of the authority to, to direct him to take up his bed and walk. Naturally, if someone comes along and is able to do that, is able to heal a lame man, he, he carries with him some weight. He carries him with him some authority. Uh, and so when, when Jesus tells him to take up his bed and walk, he takes up his, his bed and walks. So they ask him, who is the man who said you take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who, who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see you are well, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Now that's an interesting part as well. So Jesus, of course, is doing this particularly for the nature of the sign. Right? He's doing all of these things as signs. They're not just bare miracles, and we've talked about that before. But Jesus, after he heals the man, withdraws into the crowd. He doesn't stand around and engage with the man. Uh, the only reason I suspect that that's the case is precisely because it allows for the setup of the conflict between Jesus and the Jewish leaders regarding the nature of the Sabbath. Uh, because you then have this encounter between the man, uh, instead of an extended dialogue between the man and Jesus, you get this interaction between the man and, and the Jews regarding the Sabbath, and then that opens up for a discussion that will appear later, uh, beginning in verse 19. So Jesus, of course, is doing this in a calculated way. He's setting this up. After that little discussion, Jesus finds him in the temple, and says, see your well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. And you'll see there again the connection between the physical healing and the spiritual cleansing. See your well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. This does not necessarily suggest that the man was an invalid because he had committed some particular sin. That's not the issue here. Jesus is using this as an opportunity yet again to drive this man, indeed the reader, uh, to the reality that the physical healing is, is relatively minor. It's a small symbolic form of what is fundamentally more important, which is the spiritual healing, and that involves dealing with the problem of sin. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The worst thing that can happen to you that is being implied here is uh, judgment, is final damnation, which we've already seen back in chapter 3, and which we're going to see a little bit in Jesus' discourse in chapter 5. So again... The miracle itself isn't the, isn't the point. As wonderful as that is, it's driving even this man to consider, well, you have a spiritual problem that is much worse than your physical problem. And in the same way as I healed your physical problem, I heal your spiritual problem. So now go and sin no more. That is to say, live in a way uh, that, is, that is by faith. Verse 15, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. That's number one reason. That's the number one reason uh, in this particular context that John gives for the conflict between Jesus and the Jews is the Sabbath issue. Is how do you understand uh, the Sabbath? And that goes back to the discussions we previously had, even in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, regarding the Sabbath as a divinely ordained institution versus uh, other man-made traditions that surround it. And so there is this fundamental conflict. But there's a second conflict in view here as well, and that's going to come up. So notice verses 17 and 18. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. So the argument regarding the Sabbath is not the fundamental argument. 
the, the entire argument of the Sabbath hinges on whether Jesus is who he says he is. If Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God, if he is, in fact, working together with his Father for the purposes of redemption, and presumably worked with his Father in creation, as we saw in the prologue to John's Gospel, then, of course, Jesus has the authority to do with the Sabbath what he wants. He has the authority to interpret the Sabbath as he wants. He's the final interpreter of what the Sabbath means and what can and cannot be done on it. But that itself is the, is the bigger issue, right? Because the, Jew, the Jews are not going to grant that. They're going to say, well, no, he's not the Son of God. He's not working with God for the purposes of creation and redemption. And so you get verse 18. John tells us this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. That is the more fundamental issue. So what John is doing here, it's sort of interesting because when you compare it to the synoptics, uh, John isn't focusing as much as the synoptics do on some of the debates between Jesus and the, the Jewish religious leaders surrounding ceremonial law, right? Those, those arguments and debates are there. But John is trying to push back to the more fundamental issue. It's not just about the Sabbath. It's not just about interpretations of the ceremonial law. All of those debates are going to be resolved the moment that you figure out who Jesus is. That's the question. And that's the question that John is seeking to answer throughout this entire gospel. He's trying to address who is Jesus, because if you get that right, right, if we're right about who Jesus is, then everything else falls into place. All the other debates are resolved. Question. Yes. The confirmation that's coming up when Jesus defends the position of the Son of God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that between him and the Pharisees, or him and the Sadducees, or him and both? Well, I, 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 my tendency is um, uh, let's. I, I want to confine this to the language that the gospel itself uses. So sometimes you'll see different groups prioritized within the synoptics particularly. Um, for John here, notice in verse 18, he just categorizes it as the group, the Jews, right? And so here is a redemptive historical concern that we've talked about before. And that redemptive historical concern is going to come up in verse particularly 39 of Jesus' discourse here. There is a break here between <laughs> apostate Israel and what Jesus is doing. Um, there's a break between apostate Israel and what the first century church is doing. And that's, of course, going to come up as well um, in, in John's other writings. So they're both just as guilty in this sense? Uh, th yeah, they're both equally guilty in the fundamental issue of rejecting who Jesus is as the Son of God. Uh, and once you, again, that is the distinctive feature for John that defines the Christian community over against those groups. Um, and we've seen it even in, in the book of Revelation. This is why John puts it the same way in Revelation. It's the Christian church over against, whether it's the Jews or the pagans or whoever. Um, so that's what we're getting here. Verse 19, we're going to, uh, as you mentioned, we're going to get into the uh, discourse. Jesus' defense of his claim regarding his uh, deity. There are actually two parts to this. Uh, the, the, the bigger issue is the connection between the Father and the Son in their labors. The secondary issue here is the nature of eternal life and judgment. Now, again, we've seen the nature of life come up previously. Uh, we saw it particularly, of course, in the discourse with Nicodemus, uh, as well as uh, with the woman at the well. Verse 19, so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. Now, uh, there is an issue here uh, regarding the nature of the Trinity um, and the Trinity's work in the world. I think it's fair, I don't think it's a leap, to jump from John's language here, for example, and we'll see this language elsewhere, back to the scholastic uh, expression that all the works of the Trinity are undivided. Uh, all the works, omnia opera, uh, trinitatis sunt induisa, right? All the works of the Trinity are undivided. That is to say, in any, uh, and, and these are works ad extra, right? Any external act of the Trinity, 
whether it's creation or redemption, wherever you see one member of the Trinity involved, the other two members of the Trinity are involved in some way. Right Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, of course, they're playing the same role. It is uh, the, the incarnate Son of God uh, who enters into the world, suffers on the cross, dies, rises again. It's not the Father who's on the cross. It's not the Spirit who's on the cross. And yet, uh, all three members of the Trinity are involved uh, in that act of redemption. And so, on the one hand here, I think we can step back and say, okay, every work of every person of the Trinity involves the other two persons. There's never going to be a time where you see the Son operating independently of the Father or the Spirit or the Father in, uh, operating independently of the Son and the Spirit and so on. The, this is a particular application of that principle. So it's not just the case or primarily the case that John is wanting to deal with uh, those kinds of broader issues. Here he's focusing and Jesus is focusing on the nature of redemption. So particularly as it pertains to the redemption that is in view here, whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Jesus is asserting that your attitude to the Son's ministry of redemption in this gospel is also your attitude to the Father's works of redemption in Israel. Because the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. So there is a complete overlap between what the Father is doing, particularly again here as it pertains to redemption, and what the Son knows. There is a complete overlap between the knowledge of the Father and the Son. The greater works to which he refers, and greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel, brings us back to the point of the signs that we already saw. So, um, see a lame man heal, that's incredible, that's, a, that's an amazing thing, but we're going to see even greater signs than these. Of course, the greater signs to which he's pointing, particularly, you might think that there is some escalation by the end of the book of signs. So once you get to chapter 11, we're going to see Jesus actually raise a dead man. Well, raising a dead man is harder to raise, is har harder than, than raising a lame man. But it's not just that, of course, even more importantly is that seventh sign to which all the other signs are pointing, which is the resurrection of Jesus itself. And so Jesus is already hinting that the Father and the Son are working together in redemption to bring about the Son's resurrection from the dead. And the purpose of that sign, indeed of the purpose of all the other signs leading up to it, is so that you may marvel. The marvel here, it suggests then, is virtually synonymous with the belief or the faith that the signs are designed to elicit. So again, you remember the thesis statement in John chapter 20, verse 31, these things have been written that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So it's these signs are designed to elicit faith. These signs are designed to make you marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. And there's the hint at both, again, what we'll see with the resurrection of Lazarus, uh, as well as Jesus' own resurrection. For the Father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Stop right there. So notice the Father has life, and he gives judgment to the Son. The Son has life and possesses the judgment that the Father has given him. So there, there's the secondary issue. So one, we have the fundamental issue, which is the unity between the Father and the Son. Secondarily, we have the nature of life and judgment. Life and judgment are not only in the hands of the Father, they are in the hands of the Son as well. And the purpose of this, within the context of redemption, verse 23, is that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Jesus is requiring or demanding from his audience the same kind of worship, the same kind of reverence that they are to give God the Father. <laughs> Hence, again, he's not backing off the, the accusation that he's making himself equal to God. Jesus is pressing into that accusation. I am equal with God. He controls life. I control life. He gave me judgment. I have judgment over all men. And you're supposed to honor, that is to say, worship the Son just as you honor and worship the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me 
has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And there, again, is the judgment life language. So for Christ, he's asserting that the defining nature of true religion is how are you going to respond to the Son? How are you going to respond to his identity? Is he, in fact, who he claims to be, uh, the Son of God who has all of this power, the ability to give life, and the ability to judge, or does he not? And he, he's saying our decision, uh, what, to believe, what to believe about that, is going to determine whether we have eternal life or whether we come into judgment. Now, that's true in some respect, regardless of the incarnation. So even if, hypothetically, you had had no incarnation, let's say you had had no need for redemption, uh, man uh, in the garden had a responsibility to worship God, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the Son eternally always had this kind of authority. And yet you have the nature of here, the, the reference to the son, uh, Father giving the Son judgment. Um, you have the expression in verse 23 that the purpose of this is that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. And so this suggests here also a redemptive historical perspective that not only is the Son worshipped because of his identity as God, but he's also particularly worshipped because of the redemptive work that he performs. There's a glory that belongs innately to the Son as God. There's also a glory that the Son actually obtains via his humiliation and exaltation. And so you see that here as well. Verse 25, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now, again, I think it's fair to do what our, our scholastic forefathers would do and press back beyond the language in verse 23. He granted the Son also to have life in himself to point to something that is actually true of the Trinity uh, within itself, the ontological Trinity, that there is a relationship between the Father and the Son by which the Son is eternally begotten of the Father. They are completely consubstantial, uh, but there is that relationship there. And I think that then that maps onto, uh, you see that reflected even in uh, the economic Trinity here, uh, that the Son is given to have life in himself. Uh, the uh, Father grants the Son also to have life in himself. It's not suggesting that the Son did not always have this life, this power over life and death in himself. Uh, it's just suggesting that there is a redemptive historical dimension uh, to what is also reflected in an, an eternal reality. Now, also note the language in verse 25. An hour is coming and is now here. We've seen that language before. Uh, we saw that language back in, in chapter 4. Um, do you recall what the significance of that language is? An hour is coming and is now here. Crucifixion. Well, it certainly is bound up in the reality of the crucifixion. John's <clears throat> pointing us down the road to crucifixion and particularly resurrection. This seems... Oh, sorry. I'll just start to say, okay. this is his announcement telling everybody, I'm the one. I'm right, the one. yeah, he is. So he, he's, he's there among them. Uh, he, he, this, this, uh, this reality of eternal life and final judgment is already dwelling in their presence. And so I think that's fair to say that uh, Jesus is carrying that reality with him. He is already in the world. And so the hour is coming. There's a fulfillment to this. There's a fulfillment, of course, short-term fulfillment in Jesus' own resurrection uh, and a long-term fulfillment in the general resurrection of the dead. And we're looking forward to and anticipating that. But it's also the case that that eternal life and judgment is already here in Jesus. Okay, So that's why even going back to chapter 3, if you believe in the Son, it's not, some, it's not simply that you're waiting for eternal life. It's that you already possess eternal life because that eternal life exists within the Son himself. And so the, this is, of course, again, I, I used the expression before, the, this is a, an aspect of uh, the already, not yet. Already uh, in, in this world, we see uh, eternal life 
is present with us. It's granted to the church, but there is also a future fulfillment that we are awaiting, the consummation of, of that hope. So an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, but those who hear are only those that are the elect of God. Yes, um, and so you will see the you'll see the language of uh, a resurrection of both uh, the the wicked and the evil in a, in a little bit. But the focus is on yes, those who hear. It's not just biological life that's in view. Biological life is not has not been in view this entire time. So we go back to John chapter three, and when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, the life that's in view is not biological life. It is spiritual life. And so that spiritual life is in view here. And that too, by the way, is part of the already not yet. The, the word of God comes to the, the dead soul and the dead soul is given life through the word of God. That's genuine spiritual life. And it's not, it's not distinct or it's not separated from future resurrection. Those two things go together, union with Christ. Uh, it, we're brought by faith in union with Christ. And it's that very union that causes us to rise from the dead to the resurrection of life. And so the already not yet, both are dependent upon the voice of the Son of God, uh, even now and, and at our resurrection. In any case, uh, uh, 28, verse 28, uh, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, and here's that future aspect, when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And so you have this future when the sons, by his authority, he will call forth the dead and you will have two places. There are two options that you can, there are two places you can go. You can either go into life, so the resurrection of life. Again, that's the eternal life that Jesus has already uh, spoken of. And then there's the resurrection of judgment. Uh, that is to say, it's the condemnation that we've already been, already been reading about, particularly, for example, uh, back in chapter three with Nicodemus. So you have two options, resurrection of life, resurrection of judgment. The uh, destination is determined by whether uh, you believe Jesus is who he says he is and that you are united to him by that faith or whether you aren't. Uh, it really is that simple. Uh, and despite some of the complicated concepts that John is getting at with Trinitarian relationships, one of the benefits of the Gospel of John and the reason why sometimes we tell people who are new believers or who are unbelievers to read the Gospel of John first is precisely for this reason. It's because despite those complex concepts, it really boils down quite simply. You got two options, life, judgment, destination is determined by what you believe about Christ. In verse 30, Jesus then returns uh, to the, the language uh, about his relationship uh, to his father. And he says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So there's this complete agreement between the Father's judgment, what the Father says, and what Jesus says and does. There's a complete and perfect agreement at every point. However, Jesus says, verse 31, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. Now, of course, he's not saying that he's, he's not telling the truth. He's not saying that he could lie. He couldn't, right? Uh, again, he is so bound up with the Father, they are so united that it is impossible for Jesus to have lied. Uh, that's, that's just not going to happen. So what does he mean when he says, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true? Uh, this is just a way of saying that if Jesus bears witness about himself, then of course his opponents are not going to accept his testimony as true. They're going to say, well, yeah, you're saying that, but so what? And so he, he understands that they're not going to accept his testimony solely on the basis of what he says about himself. And indeed, of course, you'll recall that in the Old Testament, you need two or three witnesses uh, to, to, to judge uh, or to attest to a matter. And so that's what you get here. Verse 32, there is another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. Okay. Ultimately, the one who bears witness to Jesus is, of course, the Father. The Father himself bears witness uh, to who Jesus is, and we're going to get back down to that in uh, a few verses. He does address here, verses 33 and following, uh, the testimony of John as well. You sent to John, 
And he is born witness to the truth, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. So John is bearing true testimony. So if you're looking for a human witness, he said, well, you, you've already been to him. If you're looking for another human witness to testify about me, because you're looking for those two or three witnesses, well, you can go to John. He said, I'm not saying this because I accept human testimony. That's not the witness I'm talking about. But if you need that, right, I want you to be saved. And so that's, that's good. Go listen to what John has to say. He's telling the truth. He's fulfilling his role. But verse 36, the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. That's great. If, if you go to John, he's telling the truth. He's fulfilling his ministry. Believe what John has to say. But the testimony that I have is something even greater than John's testimony. It's the Father himself. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. So Jesus responds and says, the testimony that I am depending on to vindicate my position is the testimony of the Father himself, who has all of these signs that we're looking at, and that we'll continue to look at up through chapter 12. The entire book of signs is the testimony of the Father to the Son. Jesus is doing these works precisely because in his capacity as a mediator, the Father has granted him the ability to perform all of these signs, and that it then is, is the Father's own testimony. And the, the deciding factor about whether uh, someone actually believes that testimony or not uh, is dependent upon whether the Father's word abides in us, which, of course, is a supernatural thing. Uh, God alone can do that. Now, here I mentioned earlier, here we get to the redemptive historical concern uh, that's been present here the entire time, uh, the dealing with apostate Israel. Verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now, we'll jump down very quickly to verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. So Jesus adds even the testimony of the Old Testament prophets, particularly in this case Moses, and says, look, if you actually believed your Old Testament, it would be clear that I'm the one to whom it points. But you don't accept it. You claim to believe Moses. You claim to set your hope on his word. And yet you don't have the life that that word promises because their hearts are darkened. And consequently, because their hearts are darkened, they distort and pervert their interpretation of the Old Testament itself. Back in verse 41, you'll notice that here's the separation between uh, uh, Jesus and his audience. Uh, we've seen this uh, previously. I do not receive glory from people. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Only God? And then, of course, there's the comment about Moses that we just read. So notice, Jesus doesn't receive glory from people. His audience, the unbelieving uh, audience that he's facing, they are concerned about the glory of man. Jesus is telling them to seek the glory that comes only from God, and that's precisely the glory that he's been seeking. And here then is the, the, the diverg divergent paths. And that's why in the second half of the gospel, uh, you'll recall that verse, uh, chapters 1 to 12 are referred to as the book of signs. Chapters 13 to the end, uh, I referred to previously as the book of... What's, what's in verse 41? The book of... Starts with a G. Glory. There you go. <laughs> the book of glory. All right. So, 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 uh, so, yeah, the first 12 chapters are the book of signs. We're dealing with all of these signs. And the signs themselves point to the glory that comes from the Father alone. That is the Father's testimony to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I'm seeking that glory, that glory that finds its consummation in the resurrection of Christ at the end of the book. 
The other glory, the glory that his unbelieving audience, that apostate Israel is pursuing, is merely the glory of man, and it takes people down a very, very different road. It's the same distinction that we see between eternal life and judgment. Those are two different kinds of glory, right? The pursuit of two different kinds of glory result in two very different outcomes. Pursuit of the glory of God, as manifested in the resurrection of Christ, is the way to eternal life. The glory that is uh, this, uh, presented here as, as a, the pursuit of, of human glory uh, leads to judgment. So again, in this discourse, and we'll see similar language uh, when, once we get to chapter 6, but in this particular discourse, <clears throat> it really boils things down quite simply. Uh, John likes to present things in terms of stark contrasts, uh, and that's really helpful and really appropriate, is again, you have belief, unbelief. You have eternal life, you have judgment. You have glory of God, you have glory of man. It really is an absolute uh, contrast or absolute antithesis here uh, between Jesus' way and the way of his opponents. Well, we'll end there. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments on this particular chapter 5 or anything we've covered up to this point? When Jesus is referring to Moses' witness, mm -hmm. he's talking about the serpent in the desert being raised up what? as a symbol. Well, well, we have the, the clear reference to, to, you know, Jesus would interpret this that way, but he's not limiting it just to the serpent in the wilderness. So in verse 39, particularly, he says, you search the scriptures as a whole. So Moses is um, standing in in verses 45 and 46 for virtually the entire Old Testament, right? So you can look at Moses as uh, a microcosm of the entire Old Testament testimony to who Jesus is, and that includes things like the servant in the wilderness. But that's a good point because we might have a tendency to look at certain narratives in the Old Testament as particularly pointing to Jesus, especially those narratives or symbols that we see interpreted that way in the New Testament. But then we might think all the other stuff isn't really pointing to Jesus. And that's just not, that's not how John, Jesus is viewing this. In Jesus' view, the entire Old Testament, without exception, is a testimony to who he is, precisely because, of course, uh, the Old Testament is about the same plan of redemption that you see in the New Testament. We just see the fulfillment of that plan in the Old Testament, <clears throat> hence, not to go off on a rabbit trail now, but our view of the continuity of the covenants, right? There's a continuity uh, between Old Testament and New Testament because it is the same plan of redemption, uh, the same covenant of grace, uh, since all the way back in Genesis 3 up to the present and into the future. Anything else? Comments? Questions? All right. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we do thank you again for the signs and the testimony that you have given of your Son and your Word. Uh, we pray that your Spirit would apply it to our hearts that you would stir up and awaken our faith, that you would strengthen it, that we would uh, find our consolation and comfort in Christ, that we would pursue uh, the glory of God rather than the glory of man, and that we would <coughs> find even now and in the future that eternal life which you so abundantly promise and refuge from judgment. In Christ's name I pray, amen.